Hey everyone, it's Ryan here, and welcome to our bonus video in the Pediatric Dentistry series. So this is where I go over 15 practice questions with you that test what you learned in the series. So this is everything that we talked about in terms of pediatric dentistry and what's covered on the board exam. If you haven't already, I definitely encourage you to go back and watch the full series before attempting these questions. I broke down the material covered on the board exam into eight videos of high yield information, and this information will really help you on the board exam. So I compiled 15 questions, like I said, for us to go through together, and these will be very similar to what you see on test day. So let's start with question number one. Congenitally missing teeth are the result of failure in which stage of development? So go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so let's go through these stages one at a time. We have initiation, which is our first stage. That's where we have that focal thickening of oral epithelium. We're gonna skip our proliferation and bud stage the cap and bell, we're getting to morpho differentiation. That's where the size and shape of the tooth is being determined. Appositions, where we have the deposition of the enamel and dentin matrix. And calcification or maturation, it's where we get that mineralization of the tooth. So this is kind of in order from beginning to end here. And I, I already mentioned that morpho differentiation is, is kind of determining size and shape of the tooth. This is more structural and mineralization. At this point, the tooth is either there or it's not there. If we're having a completely missing tooth, that has to happen really early on. And in this case, initiation is really the only viable option here. Initiation or proliferation, that bud stage, are the only two stages that could cause an extra or a missing tooth altogether. If you have some kind of failure in that initial part of tooth development. If, if there was a problem with morpho differentiation, we'd have a maybe a big tooth or a malformed tooth, like a peg lateral. If it, something happened in apposition, we might have a structural abnormality like hypoplasia. And if something happened in calcification, well, we'd have a more minor structural abnormality like fluorosis, for example. So the only viable option in this question is, or the only viable answer is A. All right, so question number two. The enamel rods in the gingival third of primary teeth slope occlusally instead of cervically as in permanent teeth. The roots of primary teeth tend to be more divergent than those of permanent teeth. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so this question tests the information we talked about in the first slide in the third video on primary tooth anatomy. So the enamel rods do slope occlusally in primary teeth. That's different from permanent teeth. And the roots also do tend to be more divergent than roots in permanent teeth. And I'll show you those images in just a second. So both of these statements do happen to be true. So the correct answer here is A. And we can see the occlusally sl sloping enamel rods in the deciduous tooth, and then how the roots of the primary teeth tend to be more divergent than those in permanent teeth. All right, question number three. The mother of a five-year-old patient is concerned about the child's thumb-sucking habit. On examination, six months ago, the patient had a five millimeter overjet and three millimeter anterior open bite. Today, the patient has a three millimeter overjet and 10% overbite. The mother says that the child only sucks his thumb every night when falling to sleep. Which of the following is the best advice for the parent? So go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. Okay, so right away, you may have noticed that just in six months' time, the patient's overjet and overbite markedly improved since the last appointment. So it's likely that the mother is telling the truth here, and the oral habit has become a lot less frequent. When thumb sucking happens less than four to six hours a day, teeth can begin to assume a more normal position. The risk of malocclusion associated with the habit is a function of its frequency, duration, and intensity. 
And because the habit has decreased and the occlusion seems to be improving, the best thing to do here is to simply counsel the parent with regard to the habit and then see them back in another three to six months to monitor further improvement. Anything else here is a bit too aggressive. It's not even necessary to refer them to a speech pathologist because we're seeing such marked improvement. So the answer is the most conservative option, and that is D. Okay, question number four. A 20 kilogram child can be safely administered up to how many carpules of 2% lidocaine? Go ahead, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so this is a tricky one, and it's going to involve some mathematics. So let's do the math. Our first magic number here that we have to know is 4.4. That's 4.4 milligrams per kilogram. Remember, that's the recommended pediatric dose of lidocaine, the recommended maximum dose of lidocaine for a child. So this child, if we're doing 20 times 4.4, that's going to give us 88 milligrams of lidocaine. So for this child, 88 milligrams of lidocaine is going to be our recommended maximum. A carpule of 2% lidocaine contains 36 milligrams of lidocaine. That's our second magic number, and that comes from our pharmacology series. So if you're not sure how I got that number, make sure you check out the first video in the pharmacology series on calculations. So now that we know that 30, there are 36 milligrams of lidocaine per carpule, if we have one carpule, that's going to be 36 milligrams. Two carpules will be 72. Three carpules is going to be 108, and so on. And you might already notice here that our limit is 88. So three carpules is going to be too much. And so are four and five. So we're just down to one and two. Now 36 milligrams is definitely under the limit of 88, but two is also under it. And it's actually the closest without going over. Since the question is asking for up to how many carpules, we're going to pick the larger of these two, and we can get up to two. Now we could do two and a little bit of a third carpule, but when they ask this kind of question, they're looking for complete carpules. How many complete carpules can you safely administer to the patient? So the answer here, the closest without going over the limit of 88, is going to be two carpules. Okay, question number five. A six-year-old patient comes to their first ever dental visit, but is quite fearful. What's the most likely explanation? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll talk about this together. Okay, so many adults with dental fear and anxiety tend to verbalize their feelings and may do so in front of their child. So creating a and this creates a negative impression of dental treatment early on in the child's life. Most children at this early school age of six years emulate their parents who are looked upon as role models. As a child enters adolescence, the influence of their parents decreases while the influence of their peers increases. So depending on the age of the patient, this answer is going to change over time. But if they're a six-year-old, they're going to be modeling their older siblings and their parents. So what's going to be the most likely explanation here? Well, it's not going to be what they see on TV. It's not going to be based on their own imagination from nowhere. It's between their peers and their parents. Since they're at this six-year-old benchmark, we're a lot more comfortable going off of their parents. If they were 10, 11, 12, well, it could be more, much more likely that it's something that was influenced by their peer group. But at six, year old, at six years of age, they're going to be most likely getting this fear and anxiety 
modeled from their parents? So the answer here is B. Okay, question six. A parent comes in with a one-year-old child. How should the dentist perform the exam? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. All right, so this is the classic knee-to-knee -knee exam question that I alluded to in our series together. So if they're less than two years old, you're getting a knee-to-knee -knee exam. So that rules out answer choice A and answer choice B right away. I tried to get a little imaginative of how they might perform the exam, but we're really down to C and D here. And the correct orientation of the baby is to have their head laying on the dentist's lap so they can face the parent and the dentist can have the best access to see their mouth. So the answer here is going to be C, our classic knee-to-knee -knee exam. Expect that question on the board exam. All right, question number seven. A pediatric patient is taking amphetamine. What can be observed in the patient's health history? Go ahead, pause the video, and we'll go over this together. All right, so if we're trying to eliminate some answer choices uh, right away, maybe we can rule out COPD, which doesn't really happen in kids, but asthma, ADHD, and anxiety are all very common in children. What we need to know to answer this question is that methylphenidate, adamoxetine, and amphetamine are the three most common psychostimulant medications taken for ADHD. Those three drugs are so useful to remember for the board exam, and I pointed that out in our series because they tend to come up uh, quite often. So in this case, it nets us another correct answer being C. Okay, question number eight. In a four-year-old patient, tooth E was traumatically intruded, and approximately 50% of the crown is visible clinically. What is the treatment of choice? All right, go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. So question number eight here is a classic trap question. One of these treatment options has to be correct, right? They'd, when you're taking the board exam, they'd never make us say none of the above, right? Well, unless it can be determined that a primary tooth is impinging on the permanent successor, intruded primary teeth should be left alone in the hope that they will spontaneously re-erupt. And the same would be done for an open apex permanent tooth, though the prognosis isn't quite as good as for the primary tooth. In a closed apex permanent tooth, that should be orthodontically repositioned and then a full root canal treatment is to be expected. But in this case, with a primary tooth being traumatically intruded, we wouldn't do anything. So the answer here is actually none of the above. Okay, question number nine. What is the most common medication used for pulpotomy procedures in children? Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so glass ionomer and composite resin can be used for building the tooth back up, but the key word here is medication. So the medicine applied directly to the orifices of the pulp canals, and glass ionomer and composite resin are not that. Calcium hydroxide is certainly a medicament, but it's contraindicated in primary teeth because it causes pulpal irritation that leads to pathologic root resorption. So although uh, materials like MTA, mineral trioxide aggregate, are being used more and more, the answer for the board exam, at least for now, is always going to be Buckley's Formocresol. So the answer here is B. And this is just a picture that we showed of the classic pulpotomy. All right, we're up to question number 10. A six and a half year old child lost J early. Tooth number 14 has not yet emerged into the oral cavity. 
What space maintainer is ideal for this situation? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. All right, so if I got a question like this on the board exam, I would want to draw this one out on the scrap paper on test day. I know it takes a little bit extra time, but you do have plenty of time, and I think it's worthwhile just to draw this one out. So we'd have our primary molar, underlying premolars here, tooth J was lost early, and then tooth number 14 has not erupted yet. And so these are our teeth, and here is our gum line. So early loss of a primary second molar, your first thoughts should be a distal shoe or a Nance appliance. The lower lingual holding arch is for the mandibular arch only, so we can sort of rule that one out right away. And the band and loop on, say, the primary first molar here may not work theoretically because if that primary first molar were to exfoliate before the second premolar comes in, that space maintainer completely failed its purpose. Not to mention, there's no tooth, if we put a band and loop on here, there's no tooth for this loop part to contact distally. So that one's actually out completely as well. And the Nance is not possible because, well, the permanent first molar hasn't erupted yet. So there's nothing to band back here to have the Nance attached to. So the only viable option in this case is the distal shoe to put that part on the primary first molar and then have the distal shoe going subgingivally to keep this permanent molar erupting properly. And then probably in which case, especially if this primary molar start to got loose, start to get loose, you could consider moving up to a Nance or something once this permanent first molar has erupted. But in this situation, really our only option is the distal shoe appliance. So the answer here is going to be B. All right, question number 11. What is the treatment of choice for a primary first molar with furcation involvement? Go ahead, pause the video, and we'll go over this together. So furcation involvement are the two magic words as a sign of necrosis for a primary tooth. So no treatment and pulpotomy are definitely not options here if we have a necrotic pulp. Usually, pulpectomy would be the ideal treatment here in order to save the tooth as a space, ma as a space maintainer. But primary first molars classically have a ton of accessory canals and the success of a pulpectomy is low. Because of the difficult root canal system, the treatment of choice in this case is to extract that primary first molar and place a space maintainer, maintainer if needed to keep the space open. So the answer here is going to be D. And we can simply follow that flow chart that we talked about in order to get this answer as well. Furcation, yes. First primary molar, yes. And we're at extract. So the answer here is D. All right, question number 12. What is the proper sequence to close a midline diastema in a child with a heavy maxillary labial frenum? And we have perform a phrenectomy, wait for the upper permanent canines to erupt, close the diastema with orthodontics. So these steps are one are labeled one, two, and three, and it's up to you to determine the proper order of these three steps down here. So go ahead, think through that question, and then we'll talk about it in just a little bit. All right, so a midline diastema between tooth number eight and nine can self-correct especially if it's less than two millimeters, it should be able to self-correct with the eruption of the maxillary canines. 
So you always would want to wait for those to come in first, which concludes the quote unquote ugly duckling stage of the mixed dentition. After that, so two is definitely going to be first. So that rules out A and D. We want all the permanent teeth to be there. And then after that, the proper order is to close the diastema orthodontically first and then do the phrenectomy. Otherwise, scar tissue from the surgery between tooth number eight and nine will make closing and keeping that diastema closed very, very difficult. Whereas if we close it first and then perform the phrenect phrenectomy, some people think the scar tissue can actually help hold the teeth together. So the proper order classically and what's tested on the board exam is to wait for the permanent canines to erupt first, then close the diastema orthodontically, and then lastly perform the phrenectomy. So the correct answer is C. Question number 13, a child with which malocclusion is most susceptible to a traumatic dental injury? Go ahead, think through that, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. All right, so we talked about a couple of risk factors for traumatic dental injury in children, and one of them is the correct answer. If the upper teeth are way out in front of the lower teeth, they are simply more vulnerable of getting hit. Vertical overlap is overbite. Horizontal overlap, which is what we care about, is called overjet. Anterior open bite, midline asymmetry, not going to impact the risk of trauma. Increased overjet, that horizontal overlap of teeth, is what's going to impact possible susceptibility to injury. The further out these teeth are, the more likely something or someone can bang into those upper front teeth, which are the most commonly traumatically injured teeth. So the answer here is B. All right, so the first day of the board exam will be 400 questions with pediatric dentistry questions, just like the ones we talked about, spread throughout the, those 400 questions. On the second day of the exam, you'll be given 100 more questions that are case-based. So they give you information on a patient with some photos and x-rays, and otherwise, the questions are super similar format. So question 14 and 15 of this video will be examples of case-type questions pertaining to the same patient. So what does a radiolucency at the furcation of a primary mandibular first molar, which you can see right here, in a five-year-old patient usually indicate? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll talk about this together. Okay, so it might seem like we've glossed over the age in some of the previous questions, the age of the patient is there for a reason, and here it's very, very important and informs our answer directly. So the primary mandibular first molars begin to resorb on average at seven years old. The premolar's location between the primary roots is associated with this physiologic root resorption. Now, why is it seven years old? Well, it makes sense. The premolars are budding in utero with all the other teeth. They start calcifying at around two years of age, and it takes four to five years for them to finish calcifying. That puts us at around seven years of age, at which point the root starts to develop and the dental follicle starts gradually resorbing away the roots of the primary teeth or of this primary tooth. And it takes a few more years to complete eruption by age 10 or 11. So that's going to rule out answer choice A and C, which are physiologic by nature. This, we know, because of its early timing, is pathologic in nature. Now you can see this primary tooth has some deep caries compromising the pulp, and the infection manifests in the pulp as well as the frication area, 
which in turn can spread infection and actually disturb the ameloblastic layer of the permanent successor. So we can confidently say that the answer is B, but in case there is any doubt, a dentigerous cyst attaches to the DEJ and surrounds the crown, usually of an impacted permanent tooth. So that one is out as well. So the answer here is pulp necrosis. And finally, question number 15. This tooth, that tooth we just talked about, is going to be extracted due to the pulpal pathology. It's the first primary molar. We don't want to do a pulpectomy on it. But the five-year-old patient is uncooperative and becomes physically combative. The parents are unable to calm the child. What should the dentist do? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this last question together. So for any child patient, it is imperative to discuss any kind of physical restraint, like hand over mouth, with the parent to obtain informed consent. Remember, a child cannot give consent. Even with firm voice control, I think it's always a good idea to check with the parents first. And of course, you could probably tell just by the wording of this answer choice to force the nitrous oxide nose piece over the child's mouth and nose. You never want to be in a scenario where you're forcing something over the child's face if you can help it. So like many of the clinical scenarios tested on the board exam, we saw it once before in one of our previous questions here, the most conservative option is the best option. So to, in order to be the most conservative, we discuss with the parents first about what you want to do moving forward. So the best first option in this scenario is to check with the parents first. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments how many questions you got right, how you did, and how you enjoyed this series. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to my channel for more on dentistry coming soon. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Leonella Bunger, Zahir Anani, Ria Wadwa, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjir, Badir Hafnawi, and all of my patrons out there for their support. You guys, let me do what I do here, and I'm very grateful to all of you. You can unlock extras like access to these slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam just like these, so go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video series.